Welcome to what is likely the most fun video I've ever made. I dropped the last Helldivers video a few weeks ago and the response was absolutely certifiably wild. There are quite literally more than a thousand comments reporting me to the local democracy officer for my thought crimes. And why wouldn't you report me? You're all entirely and unequivocally brainwashed loyal heroes of Super Earth. But among those thousand comments, there were also a few theories that stuck out. Headcanon that would probably put your head in the crosshairs of a cannon from Super Earth. You get it. So today, let's look at some of the best fan theories I was able to pick out from the comments. Thank you all for participating and making this fun. I hope you enjoy the video, and if you've got more that you want me to cover, let me know in the comments. With that, let's kick things off at the top of our list with the very first fan theory. Villains. This one comes from user js3po3qq7r. I don't know what that is, but anyway, they place us in the shoes of a Helldiver questioning everything they've ever lived and fought for, saying, Helldiver, are we the baddies? All right, I'm just kidding. Of course, Helldivers are the good guys. Let's just move on to the next one. What kind of sick person would ever think that Helldivers are a force for evil? That's just wild, unsubstantiated, dare I say, treasonous behavior. If I came across the Helldiver spouting this nonsense, I'd give him a piece of my mind, you know? Report him straight to the nearest democracy officer. No questions asked. Illuminate from within. All right, all right. Let's talk about a super intriguing theory that comes to us from Just Neon 7978 The Illuminates are going to come into play near the center of the map, not the edge like the bugs or bots. We know they have cloaking technology, and I think a surprise attack near Super Earth isn't beyond reach for them. I saw this comment and discussion a few times, and a lot of it is based on the appearance of these cloaked ships that float up in the sky over automaton-controlled planets. I wasn't able to confirm if they ever appear over terminated planets, so let me know in the comments if you've seen them there as well. So, there are these large, nondescript, essentially, holes in the sky in the shape of massive starships. Okay, really quick, this reminded me. I know I said spaceship troopers a couple times in the last video when I meant starship troopers. Sincerest apologies. Won't happen again. I promise it will only be space starship troopers from now on. Anyways, huge cloak ships are up in the sky, and there's really only one culprit that it could possibly be. Short of there being an entirely new faction that we haven't been introduced to, the only logical answer is that there are illuminate ships floating just off-planet, cloaked in what is admittedly the worst cloaking technology I've ever seen. I mean, come on, what's the point of cloaking technology if you can still tell exactly where the ship is? I thought the illuminate were supposed to be some sort of super advanced species. This almost makes me think that it's actually just a bug in the game that we're seeing, and they're some sort of artifact from the Helldiver ships that are loaded onto the map. I don't know. Let's ignore that issue for now, and just assume that there are Illuminate ships up in the sky that everyone can see. Why might they be parked above automaton planets? Why would they be around the battlefield, period? Super Earth eradicated them, right? Well. What if the Illuminate are actually gearing up for a different kind of attack? Not one that starts at the outskirts of the galaxy like the Terminids or the Automatons, or potentially the Cyborgs at some point, but rather what if they strike us on our home turf? Maybe the reason they're cloaked over the battlefield is a form of reconnaissance. They're forward operating bases that are focused on understanding the military technology that Super Earth has this time around so they can be better prepared. Last time, Super Earth reportedly demolished the Illuminate despite them being a more technologically advanced species, so I'd imagine they'd be looking for every advantage they could find this time around, and once they're ready, they'll spring a trap close to home, or God forbid, on Super Earth itself. Using their cloaking technology, not only can they scout out our defenses, but they could also strategically pick out an especially vulnerable position, even going so far as to park above Super Earth and rain lead, or plasma, from above. All while the Helldivers are gallivanting around the universe, playing with bugs and 
glorified action figures. Last stop for 9 billion miles. Have you ever seen those signs in Australia where before you drive into the outback, drivers are given warnings like no fuel for 500 kilometers? This is one amongst a plethora of other reasons of why I would avoid Australia at all costs. I'm kidding. I'm sure it's a lovely country full of great food, fun serving spots, and eldritch horror monsters that defy all human understanding. Let's turn our attention back to lighter-hearted topics, the Spanish Inquisition and colonization around the 15th century. From user a normal human 266 who supposes a more interesting purpose behind the spread of the terminid infestation. I've heard somewhere that Spaniards left some pigs on uninhabited islands and areas to serve as food sources in the event that someone got shipwrecked there. Maybe it's something similar with the bugs, where they were spread around so they could be used as a bootleg emergency fuel supply. We've speculated a lot about the purpose and driving force behind the spread of the terminids, but most of the speculation revolves around their spread being an efficient means of harvesting element 710. Oil. I'm just going to say oil. A more efficient means of harvesting additional oil. But a normal human 266 speculates that their spread actually has much more practical purposes. Mind you, this still presupposes that Super Earth, or potentially the Illuminate, are responsible for spreading the Terminids around the galaxy. So, Shut your ears if you're afraid of a little anti-super-earth talk. Rather than their spread being akin to a farmer planting corn across a few different fields, potentially as a way to diversify their investment in case one area doesn't perform as well as they expect, terminids are instead a lifeline. Potentially, earlier super-earth forces discovered the oil they could harvest from terminids, and while they were also trying to expand their dominion across the galaxy, found that they didn't have enough fuel to keep going. So, rather than having to transport fuel all the way out to the Outer Rim planets, why not just build another oil refinery at the location where the fuel is needed? Approaching it from a more economical perspective, this really makes perfect sense. Helldivers are employed at a negligible cost to farm the Terminids on Outer Rim planets, then any costs that are incurred would quickly be offset by the massive transportation and logistics savings from getting your fuel at the point that it's needed. Honestly, this almost feels too reasonable to be a theory, and more likely just a byproduct of the way good super-earth business is done. The only potential hole I can see is that there tend to only be terminids on one side of the map, which may just be a meta-observation. The Terminids and the Automatons aren't teaming up. Yet. But it still leaves a bit of a hole in this theory that Super-Earth only has refuel stations when they're going east, but not when they're going west into Automaton territory. But really, apart from that, I love this theory. If humans in the real world in 2024 ever make it out into the universe, we'll probably have to do something similar and put fuel in orbit, rather than carry it all from Earth with each launch. So kudos on a really awesome fan theory. Hey, by the way, did you know that if you're watching right now, there's a 97.8% chance that you aren't subscribed to the channel? Take a second to subscribe and click the bell for notifications. It helps us grow the channel and it allows me to spend more time creating videos for you. And most importantly, I'll love you forever. Okay, on to the next one. Revenge is a dish best served with hot lead. I absolutely love this one. It flips the entire narrative of Helldivers on its head in what would end up being such a satisfying plot twist if Arrowhead were to go in this direction. As we've talked and joked about, it's an open secret that maybe, just maybe, Super Earth are the bad guys here. And by extension, the Helldivers are not the shining examples of humanity that we're told they are. In fact, Another one of you commented about this and taught me something new. I'm not going to read the entire comment, but you can pause to read if you want. Milan Stevic 8424 brings us all the way back to English class to discuss the topic of a Byronic hero. What I find incredible is that the Helldivers are practically farmed and indoctrinated into loyalty. 
If George Orwell could have written his books without using words, this is the video game he would make. This world building is especially important if you consider the questions of morality. You, as the protagonists, are completely anti-heroic, no matter what you do. You can practically be as virtuous as possible, and a phenomenal human being who hugs everybody and is considerate to everyone, but if the organization that employs you is bad, very bad on a galactic scale, doesn't that make you a villain? In fact, you are not anti-heroic, you are what is known as a Byronic hero. A hero who exclusively does bad things for the greater good. However, unlike the classical depiction of Byronic heroes, the way you belong to a brainwashed society aligns you well with the ordinarily heroic virtues, and classic tropes of a loner rejected by society who has a distaste for social norms and is self-destructive simply do not apply anymore. So all of this is a direct question in your face. Are you loyal to this kind of service? And people already have their response deeply embedded inside them, including me, although I'll be reported to the nearest democracy officer for having crime thoughts. Yes, Milan, you are probably going to be reported to a democracy officer. I will see you there. But all this raises an interesting question. We are playing as this Byronic hero, this anti-hero protagonist that is admittedly fun to play as. But I think part of it comes with the presupposition that we're playing as humans. It's easier to accept what we're doing because it so closely mirrors our current world. But what if we look to serial chiller 4522 to break us from that mold as they question the entire perspective of the game? My personal conspiracy theory, expanding on the Illuminate Puppet Master hypothesis, what if humanity was completely subjugated by the Illuminates after the First Galactic War? Super Earth is actually the Illuminate homeworld, or maybe just a forward operating base, and they use Helldivers to defend it. They farm humans by incubating them in a super-Earth simulation, like the Matrix, and this is why they have memories of family, friends, etc. When fully formed, they're put through either the Helldiver training simulation, or an SEAF simulation, see below, frozen, and then sent off to either bug or automaton territory. So, think of unfreezing on your destroyer as being born into the real world for the first time. With Helldiver life expectancy plus or minus two minutes, they'll never have time to sort out the truth. As for the normal looking human bodies found at these sites and others, they could be the Super Earth Armed Forces engineers who went through Super Earth Armed Forces simulation training cycle while incubated and after being born, lived long enough to figure out what's going on. They rebel, which is why they're being put down. Going one step further, what if the cyborgs are all that's left of original humans? They're in hiding, augmenting themselves for a rematch to reclaim their place in the galaxy. They created the automatons using scraps and dead helldivers to serve, as the game has stated, a vanguard, to help them buy more time until they're ready for a full-scale attack. Repurposing enemy soldiers conserves resources they don't otherwise have. This whole time, we're running around as Helldivers, putting down Terminids and Automatons left and right, and we feel good, because Helldivers are a self-insert. We're defending freedom, and yada yada yada. But what if it's all a lie? Under the helmet, Helldivers are nothing but the tools of the Illuminate, thoroughly and completely controlled by the Illuminate faction to do their bidding. Think about it. You, as a player, don't have any history with the character you're playing. You don't build up their skills over time, you're just given control of a random Helldiver and told to go at it. You could essentially be the futuristic equivalent of a drone operator, sitting on your couch controlling a Helldiver out in the field. In fact, in this scenario, it might be that we are actually playing as the Illuminate. Meanwhile, the true humans are what's left of the cyborg faction on Cyberstan. If we ever make it there, we may find that they're more familiar than we've been warned. I'll leave this one with one final pie-in-the-sky idea. Imagine the Helldivers make it to Cyberstan and discover that the cyborgs are actually sympathetic, that we realize we're being controlled by the Illuminate, and that the cyborgs might actually be our allies. 
Instead of calling in airstrikes, maybe we call in a squadron of cyborgs to help us on the battlefield. I'm probably putting ideas out there that are way too ambitious, but that's what I get for diving so deep. Precious Cargo on Board Next up, a theory that will strike at the heart of the mystery around the Helldivers. We all know that they're woken up out of cryosleep to fight on the front lines, but what if we apply the same thought as the previous theory, the one talking about leaving fuel depots across the galaxy, to the Helldivers themselves? This theory comes from your boy Chips Ahoy 6758, though they claim it comes from someone else. Likely story, Helldiver. I won't report you to the Ministry of Truth if you don't report me. Chips Ahoy says, Saw this somewhere on Reddit, but the defend launch rocket mission passengers may be frozen Helldivers kept on that planet. So, rather than bringing out Helldivers from Super Earth all the way to planets they need to fight on, what if they're already there, waiting on faraway planets as literal sleeper agents, waiting to be woken up and sent into battle? You, as a fellow Helldiver, are sent in on a rather simple defense mission to evacuate high-value assets, but it's not clear what those assets actually are. It's worth noting that the other launch mission is explicitly called out as a mission to launch an ICBM, not to evacuate high-value assets. In the ICBM mission, you're told the purpose of your mission, and even if you don't always believe it, you can see the missile exploding after launching it. In the evacuation missions, they are just that, evacuations. You are explicitly removing something from the planet, though what that something is, we don't know. Imagine now that you're running a two-front war spread out across dozens of planets in the galaxy. One of your biggest inconveniences would be getting soldiers to the front lines. Maintaining supply lines is a necessary thing in war, and getting cut off from your source of inventory would spell certain defeat. Instead, you might consider seeding each planet with additional resources, and seeing as you can indefinitely freeze humans and wake them up whenever they're needed, why not just store some planet side? You obviously can't store hundreds of thousands of Helldivers on the ships, and I'm sure it costs a lot of space money to constantly ferry Helldivers from Super Earth to random planet systems across the galaxy. We know that Super Earth is nothing but cost conscious. Overall, a pretty interesting theory. I'd say my biggest problem with it is not so much a problem as it is a question. These missiles with high value assets are on planets that are not under Super Earth control, so we're forced to come to two explanations. Either A, the stored Helldivers are being planted there in secrecy, possibly stored there soon after Helldivers begin to liberate the planet, or B, these Helldivers have been there for a long time. As in, they've been there since Super Earth had control over all of these territories and planets. I guess on the short end of that time frame, we're talking about six months to a year, but the other possibility is that these Helldivers have been frozen on the planets for much, much, much longer, planted there and maintained like cattle soon after the end of the First Galactic War. Super Earth has managed this stock of soldiers across the galaxy as a contingency, ready to activate whenever a new Galactic War was poised to begin. Despite this being a little more far-fetched, it's so far-fetched that it almost seems like the more plausible option to me. But what do you think? There are probably a few other plot holes in here. I'm not sure about the timeline to plant these soldiers across all of these planets, not to mention the actual number of Helldivers you would need to support a program like this, especially in the earlier days of Super Earth, or the period of time immediately following the First Galactic War. There likely would have been a shortage of soldiers after successfully driving back the Terminids, Cyborgs, and Illuminate. I'm not certain Super Earth would have had enough volunteers to make a program like this worthwhile. Sending a few hundred divers to a few planets probably wouldn't be that effective. You would need to send thousands to each planet to have contingencies around the galaxy. I'm too deep down the pipeline. Time to back up to the source. Eradicating the Source At the time of recording this video, 
actually, this is based on the time that I wrote the script, which is probably a few days before I recorded it, and a few more before I can edit everything. But at the time of writing, the battle is raging on with the automatons in the northwest region of the map. We haven't reached Cyberstan yet, but we're making our way. Or at least, we're trying to. Much can be said about Cyberstan, the homeworld of the cyborgs, and I really have already said a lot about it. But it raises another question. We know about the home world of the cyborgs, Cyberstan. We also know about the home of the Helldivers, Super Earth. But Patrick Nerdu 744 raises another question. Where is the Illuminates' homeworld? We do know that they surrendered themselves to us at the end of the First Galactic War, and after they surrendered their technology to us, they were imprisoned on their homeworld under Super Earth's Overwatch. The same question is why we do not see the Terminids' homeworld. Did we do something terrible to them? A couple points here. Patrick mentions that Super Earth imprisoned them on their homeworld. I'm not totally sure if that's true. I think I may need some of you to confirm from the first Helldivers, but I believe the Illuminate just surrendered and then fled back into deep space, essentially to a place where humanity couldn't follow. So whether we'll ever find them is a mystery. But I do want to touch on the last point. Where is the Terminid homeworld? And did we do something terrible to them? First of all, I think it's pretty obvious that we did something terrible. That's pretty much all Super Earth does. Terrible things. The Terminids do have a homeworld attributed to them, Kepler Prime. But like the Illuminate home planet, it doesn't show up on the map for the current war. That isn't to say we haven't been there, though. Missions in Helldivers 1 sent Helldivers to Kepler Prime to clear out Terminid Hives, so maybe there will be opportunities in the future for Helldivers to head back out there and see where we left things. That said, there are some interesting theories I came across while researching for this topic with a post from Alien Finder X on Reddit. I've been studying the galactic map and I noticed something. Both Kepler Prime and Skboth Shrine, the homeworlds of the Bugs slash Terminids and the Illuminate slash Squeath, are nowhere on the map, while the homeworld of the Cyborgs, Cyberstan, can be found. What happened to those worlds? I can see Super Earth keeping the location of Skwabai Shrine a secret, as it's a treasure cove of advanced technology, but Kepler Prime? Unless Kepler Prime was somehow destroyed when it was pumped completely dry of Element 710, oil, it would not make any sense why it's not marked on the galactic map, unless Super Earth had erased planets from the map as there's something on the planet that they would not like the citizens to know. Maybe a terminated queen of some form of ruling caste? Something like the brain bug from Starship Troopers? To me, the most interesting point here is the idea that maybe the Super-Earth government erased the planets from the map. I'd assume that they were far outside the map and we had just zoomed in on a closer view of the galaxy, but what if they're really within reach and yet Super-Earth just doesn't want us to see them, or by extension, travel to them? Alien Finder X already picked most of the speculation meat off the bone here, but I do think the possibilities are super interesting. We already know, based on the past videos, that Bile Titans would have been considered medium or small on their home planet. So what if Super Earth is hiding something much, much larger on Kepler Prime? Something so large that no amount of 500 kilogram explosives and ICBMs of Liberty would scratch it. Sure, the Hive Lords are probably coming, but think bigger. Something truly colossal. The sort of terminated endgame boss, something that all players will have to simultaneously attack in order to eventually destroy. I've had a pretty good record at guessing future developments, but I don't think my odds are too high on this one. It would be pretty awesome though. Unlikely Partners Another one of my favorite theories coming up here if not solely because the actual implications for playing the game would be so interesting. This one comes from Jerryboy7810, who says, My theory is that at some point there's going to be a type of alliance between the bots and bugs orchestrated by the Illuminate. We're going to fight both groups on the same maps. Well said, Jerryboy. As much as I really want this one to be true, I think it makes sense 
I just don't think it's going to happen. But let's talk about the idea first. Honestly, the purpose, motives, and plans behind the Illuminate are central to a couple of the theories on here. Really, I'm just hoping I can release this video before they actually show up on the battlefield. My pet theory here is that I don't think the Illuminate are going to show up until we are literally on the doorstep of Cyberstan. From a meta perspective, Arrowhead probably wants to space out the main game events and reveals as much as they can while they keep the player base active. This is, of course, if they don't lose everyone after that PlayStation Network debacle. Regardless, I put this theory here because I think it makes a good intro and jumping off point to a few other theories. To set the stage, we have the Illuminate somewhere out there, hiding in the galaxy, getting ready to attack. We know from data leaks that their characters are there, it's really only a matter of time. But what the narrative will be is still a complete mystery. The simple answer is that they will function as their own separate faction. The Terminids, the Automatons, and the Illuminate will battle against Helldivers in each of their perspective parts of the galaxy, never crossing paths, always just one faction against another. But what if we imagine a more interesting and more dynamic playing field? The Illuminates in Helldivers 1 were known in part for their shielding technology. They're a more peaceful species, they're not the aggressors we see with the automatons. What if instead of engaging directly, the Illuminate would show up on the map with another faction, maybe both, and function primarily as a support role, sitting at the back of the battlefield directing traffic, placing shields around terminids or automatons, maybe disrupting your own shields, the possibilities are endless, and it would really add a complex new dynamic to the gameplay. From the lore perspective, it does kind of make sense. I talked in the previous video about the Illuminate operating from the shadows, and while they might not get along with the Terminids, that doesn't mean they can't control them or funnel them in the right direction against Super Earth. If I were a super advanced alien species, I wouldn't join the fight right away either. I would fight a proxy war, sending another faction's soldiers in to do the dirty work and soften up my enemy before sweeping in for the killing blow. To be completely honest, while I think this is a really interesting direction for the game to go, a large part of me thinks, especially after theorizing on how the gameplay would work, that a joint operation between the Illuminate and another faction would literally be too difficult which is most of the reason that I just don't think it'll happen. Video game enemies are designed to have weaknesses that are exploitable by the players. Finding and using those exploits feels good, but only if the player feels like they are just barely surviving. That they just barely destroyed the last automaton hulk raging towards them, or just barely dodged the projectile bile from a titan, as soon as you introduce another faction into the battlefield that fills that weakness, the game could get very hard. Think about other games where you've had some sort of healer enemy or spawning enemy in the back ranks and you've been unable to reach them. Meanwhile, you're getting overwhelmed by the grunts at the front, too many to fight off. That's the future I'm picturing with an Illuminate Alliance. And for that reason, I think it would just be too difficult for players and Arrowhead wouldn't do it. Please prove me wrong. 50% bug, 50% human, 100% disgusting. Okay, actually it's like 99% disgusting. Sobless Fire Main has two theories. The first is the 1%. It's cute. The remainder is abomination status. Sobless Flame Main says, I have two theories, one being kind of silly and joking around, and the other one is serious. The silly one is that the Terminids aren't actually trying to hurt us, they just want to play and give us hugs, but they don't know how. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that the Terminids are just bug versions of Quokka, cute, friendly little animals that don't know enough about humans to fear them, and instead of trying to annihilate every Helldiver that drops, they just want some attention. Yeah, okay, down to the real theory. The serious one is that the Terminids as we know them right now incorporated human DNA into their own at some point. If you look at their patrols, you'll sometimes see them either walking single file or the smaller ones are grouped around the larger, almost like a defensive perimeter. Now this 
is a theory. Not only are the automatons repurposing human bodies for their armies, the Terminids are actually our long-lost cousins. In my mind, there are two ways to approach this idea, and they vary based on the party responsible for these half-bug, half-human monstrosities. But first, let's investigate the claim of their patrols. Do they exist as described, and is that a phenomenon specific to humans? I'll admit, it was a little difficult to find clips of Terminates marching in a line that's similar to how the automatons march and patrol, but they are bugs, so can we cut them a little bit of slack? Let's assume that they do have some patrolling behavior. Is that only a human thing? N not so much. There is very specifically a children's song, or a Dave Matthews Band song, depending on how old you are, that describes this. The ants go marching one by one. Hurrah, hurrah. Fun fact, as I was digging into this a little more, that children's song is actually based on a marching ballad written to celebrate Civil War era soldiers returning home from conflict. The original first line is, when Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. It's like, no matter how hard we try, we just can't escape war. So, the Ants Go Marching is based on a war song about humans marching, but ants do march, or at least they do follow one another in a straight line. The reason for this tends to boil down to pheromones. The leader ant sends off some signals that the rest follow, but they are kind of still marching. Okay, okay, okay. No shade. We're going to assume the Terminids do march, and that it is in fact a uniquely human characteristic at least when it comes into marching into battle. That brings us to the crux of this theory. Somewhere along the evolutionary path for Terminids, human DNA was introduced. I think the less likely option is that the Terminids accomplished this on their own. Though impossible in the real world, in video game world the only explanation I can think of for this path would have to do with the Terminids having a steady diet of Helldivers. That, coupled with plenty of mutating agents around them, like termicide, led to the Terminids integrating some of that human DNA. Unlikely. The more plausible option to me is that when the scientists of Super-Earth were genetically modifying the bugs, likely to make them produce more oil, someone got a little spicy. Whether it's 50% human DNA, I doubt that. We're only like 1% away from chimpanzees or something, right? A 50% human Terminid would literally look like that spider crawling toy in Toy Story? Yeesh. No, instead, it could be plausible that a super earth scientist got the bright idea that introducing a small amount of human DNA might further develop the terminated cerebral cortex. In other words, make their brains work better. Or more super. What purpose might that serve? Good question. Think for a moment about how we raise sheep. We use tools like herding dogs to control them, move them around, make our lives easier. But that requires that the sheep have some form of lower intelligence to perceive and understand what the herding dog is doing. They are able to understand their surroundings and flee to more protected areas. You can't necessarily say the same about bugs. They just either ignore you or they scatter. Maybe the plan was to give the Terminids a little bit more brain power in order to make them easier to farm, but all that backfired when they escaped and used their newfound intelligence to coordinate attacks more effectively, leading us to the current situation. Alright, that was an insane amount of speculation in that one, but still an interesting theory. Let's move on to the next one. Adapt or Die Alright, on to a theory that is in some ways a tangent off a couple other theories on here. We know about the cyborgs, we know what they generally look like, at least we know what they looked like a hundred years ago, but we're also given reasons from Super Earth as to why they have started to augment their bodies. Quote, they have become obsessed with the manipulation of their bodies and constantly seek to pervert the skin with machines that, according to them, gives them a higher meaning in life. But have we ever taken Super Earth at face value? Von Ludwig6083 asks the same question, wondering whether or not the story from Super Earth is entirely factual. Here's their theory. 
The cyborgs began altering themselves due to Super Earth putting them into the harsh climates of Cyberstan. They were miners that were being torn apart by the condition and had to adapt themselves with machines to survive. This ties back to the idea behind why the cyborgs fled Earth and whether or not they were cyborgs when they fled. That is to say, when the cyborgs were treated from Super Earth, it's possible that they were not actually cyborgs at that point in time, but rather just normal rebels and dissidents that Super Earth wanted to eradicate. When these rebels fled Super Earth, or were otherwise relocated to Cyberstan, they found themselves in an environment that was not quite suitable for human life. To deal with that harsh reality, these humans who went to Cyberstan began augmenting themselves in order to keep up with the demands of a cold, hostile planet. Furthermore, I think what Von Ludwig is getting at here kind of reminds me of the Red Rising series. I'm not sure if anyone here will get that reference, but these citizens of Cyberstan are sent to mine resources, and over time, in combination with adapting to the harsh climate, also begin adapting to their main job, mining. So Super Earth will walk around and say that the cyborgs created themselves, but in reality, at least in this theory, it's actually the forced relocation to Cyberstan and the forced labor on behalf of Super Earth that's actually what caused the formation of the cyborgs. Super Earth, with all their talk of treason, is actually the party most responsible for creating the cyborg threat that we faced in the First Galactic War. Now, as far as theories go, I'd say there might actually be some meat on the bone here. Oftentimes, what I would look for in a theory in order to judge it as plausible is how closely it mimics the real world. Many times the developers are getting inspiration from the current world or historical events. Now, there aren't any cyborgs in the real world as of yet, but there are plenty of times in history and presently where a group of people is roped into forced labor, poor living conditions, and general oppression. And it's these exact circumstances that become a breeding ground for rebellious activities. So applying this to the world of Helldivers makes me think that even though we've spun a long thread here, it's not entirely out of the question. I guess this whole cyborg and illuminate business is such an open secret at this point that everyone has a pet theory to throw around. If you have any of your own, put them in the comments. I'm still working on a follow-up for this video of fan theories that I didn't get to, so there's still time to incorporate it and get a shout out. That is, if you aren't scared of a couple Super Earth officers knocking on your front door. Cyborg Red Energy Truthfully, this was one area that I didn't do justice in my previous video. I think in part because it's hard to find many clips and images of it, but there are a few and there was a small conversation in the comments about it, so I'm going to cover it. In essence, it wasn't too dissimilar from some of the other topics discussed here, but I did at least want to address it. So, a viewer on Terrace Dragon brings it up, saying, You're missing the cyborg red energy they harvest from humans. Ever run through the battles and see the cages, bodies, and red energy containers? Looks like the humans are being used like the bugs. Simyao follows up, saying, Bonts want human brains for something, so it might be related to creating more automatons. And Anon1403 closes out the thread, commenting, I theorize that they use their brains and the energy to turn the humans into automatons in the factories. Now, this theory is all but confirmed at this point. When you come across automaton corpses nowadays, supposedly they are substantially more fleshy than they were in the past all but confirming that it's not all just metal and oil going on in there. In fact, many divers have noticed that when returning from a mission on an automaton planet, they don't come back covered in oil. No, instead they come back covered in blood. And there really truthfully isn't much of a reason for automatons to have blood in them unless they are still somehow partially human. What I really want to key in on here is something that Antares Dragon says in their final sentence. Looks like the humans are being used like bugs. What a cool twist. It's almost like every faction is using another faction to survive somehow. 
The only one we don't have a similar story for is the Terminants, but stick with me here. I'm about to throw out a wild suggestion. In the past, I've talked at length about how Super Earth is likely responsible for shuttling Terminids around the galaxy, putting down rebel groups, or otherwise just sending them around to keep the war going. But what if, rather than the Terminids being moved around by Super Earth, they are in fact moving themselves around via the Helldivers? Maybe, just maybe, when a Helldiver enters a Terminid infested area, they breathe in some kind of spores or some form of Terminid eggs, and once they leave to another area and eventually die, potentially on another planet across the galaxy, those eggs hatch and bring forth a new wave of Terminids. It could be why there's a small number of Terminid kills verified on mainly automaton-controlled planets. But back to the point at hand. The automatons are almost certainly using parts of human bodies to create new automatons, which makes the giant AT-AT factory striders even more terrifying. Think about what must be going on inside of those things. Unfortunately for those humans, I'm guessing there's a pretty tight window of time between harvesting and turning a human into automaton, which would imply that the humans on board those factory striders are still alive. So, is this one settled? I don't really even want to call it a fan theory, but I think I have to until it's 100% confirmed. While we ponder on that one, let's move to the next theory. Rings on rings on rings. FYI, this one has a small spoiler that features content that was found in the game's data files. If you don't want potential spoilers for something that hasn't happened in the game yet, you can ignore this one, mute it, or skip ahead. The Galactic Map is quite a useful tool. It shows you the current status of the ongoing conflict, where Super Earth is pulling ahead, or more likely, where Helldivers are being annihilated. As it currently stands, it shows our conflict between the automatons and the Terminids mapped out across roughly 10 concentric rings. Within those rings are sectors that group several planets together, but the point remains, there are about 10 tiers of distance from Super Earth. But what if I were to tell you that this doesn't account for everything? Thanks to viewer Xander Whitcroft's buddy and a host of other individuals online that have mined the ever-living heck out of Helldivers 2, we have a little bit more knowledge about what might be coming. Interesting knowledge. The map is bigger than what you're able to see. My buddy opened the game files, and there are like two to three more rings on the outer edge of the map. Two or three extra rings around the map may not sound like a ton, but once you put it into perspective, that makes room for potentially another 60-ish planets. That's conservative. We're talking about an insane increase in the number of planets that must be liberated. But it does kind of beg the question, what's the point of adding additional rings if it's just to add new planets that need to be liberated? If it's the same mission over and over, it doesn't seem like additional planets would really add all that much to the gameplay. In fact, it might even dilute it. The devs can, in fact, just change the status of the war on a whim. It might seem like the players are in control, and they might provide a bit of guidance, but let's be real. Arrowhead is planning exactly how far Helldivers are able to push, how fast they're able to liberate, and likely, how difficult a mission is at any given point in time. I wouldn't be shocked if the entire percent liberated status is arbitrary and made up. There isn't really any way for the players to fact check when there are hundreds of thousands of other players diving constantly. So if that's the case, and adding additional planets just for the sake of adding them doesn't really make sense, what's the point? Why expand the map that much if it would just dilute everything down? Open your mind with me for a moment and expand your horizons. We all have some understanding that the Illuminate will likely make a return. The cyborgs might also come back, which means that we very well might be fighting a four-front war. But why stop there? Expanding the galactic map opens up new territories for new enemies, and potentially entirely new factions. Think about it. If you were Arrowhead Games, would you be content with using the same factions as your previous game? Sure, they added in the automaton threat, 
But the Terminids already existed, and if they bring back the Cyborgs and the Illuminate, many players will have already faced these enemies before. No, instead, I'm theorizing here that there are potentially as many as three new factions that could be introduced over time. Up top, you have a clear space between the Terminids on the right and the Automatons on the left, directly to the north of Super-Earth. It seems like a prime location for either the Illuminate or the Cyborgs to take a foothold. I also think the Cyborgs could show up on the other side of the Automaton faction, but after you add these two additional factions, you still have so much room left on the map. There's so much room, in fact, that it feels intentional. Surely all the room to the south is prime real estate. For two additional factions at the very least, potentially even three? Who, or what then, would make up these factions? I've got a few possibilities I'll throw out, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments about what they might be. First up, a somewhat obvious suggestion, a, a faction of other human rebels from Super-Earth. Distinct from the cyborgs, this would be a faction of individuals that fled the reign of Super-Earth and have been fighting back from the edges of the galaxy. These are the people responsible for putting up those illegal broadcasts that Helldivers have to take down. There are callouts in the leaked data that hint at a character or enemy type of civilian, and an ability for those civilians to handle weapons, but this might be related to the rescue missions or other interactions you have on board the ships. It's not clear. A second new faction would be something completely out of the blue, an enemy type completely distinct from the Terminids, Automatons, Cyborgs, and the Illuminate. I'm probably grasping at straws here, but in order to keep the enemy types balanced, I'm thinking it would have to be another living organism slash animal type, like the Terminids, but with completely distinct abilities from the bugs. And maybe there are new maps that would align with those enemy types. I'm picturing gigantic bears and other mammals running around trying to destroy the Helldivers. I don't know why we'd be fighting them in the first place, but it could be interesting. Or, the developers could channel their inner Halo Combat Evolved and introduce some type of zombie enemy like the Flood, an enemy that would actively take over your fellow Helldiver's bodies and launch orbital strikes at you would be a wild addition. Enough speculating though, let me know your ideas below and we'll see if any of us end up being correct. Fresh. Never frozen. Okay, Helldivers, listen up. We need you on the front lines defending Super Earth and spreading liberty wherever you go. Don't worry, your friends and families will be incredibly proud of you, and they'll be waiting for you to return. They'll throw parades in your honor. You'll be a hero. You'll... What? Huh? When will you get to go home? Um... Uh, does your family know where you're going? Well, they... What year is it? Okay, don't worry about it, soldier. Just get ready to take a long nap. We all know that Helldivers are frozen and taken out of storage only when they're needed, but we also know that the Helldivers themselves are not aware of that fact. They're woken up when Liberty needs defending, only to last an average of two minutes on the battlefield. But this theory comes from Mr. Cool Five-Year-Old. They take it a step further. How long have the Helldivers been frozen? And do Helldivers ever return from war? We just glazed over a few important questions when talking about the frozen backup divers. How long have they been on freeze? How many are there on freeze? How can they have a family if they're frozen down? Potentially, you could give your body for Super Earth, then get frozen during transport to the front, then stay on freeze for hundreds of years until the hell diver before you finally dies. Your family's long gone, bro. All really good questions. Theoretically, if we're in a society that can hold soldiers in a frozen state, the only reason to do so is to keep them there for a long time. Super-Earth has faster-than-light travel. It's not like it takes especially long to get from one side of the galaxy to another. Why would Helldivers need to be frozen unless they're expected to be there for an indefinite amount of time? We really only see Helldivers being thawed out, not frozen which would imply to me that we're mostly just pulling them out of storage. A stockpile of Helldivers that Super-Earth has been building up over the course of the last... century? I don't know. If the same freezing component existed in Helldivers 1, 
someone that played that will have to let us know. But I'm wondering aloud here that if the freezing of Helldivers didn't start until after the First Galactic War, and then continued for the past 100 years, Super Earth propaganda has kept the enlistment rates high enough that they've continuously stocked up, building a reserve of troops that would be prepared to battle any enemies that came out of the woodwork in the future. Further, if they only expect you to survive for two minutes on average, there really isn't any risk. The likelihood of most Helldivers making it through more than one or two missions is so low that the risk of revolt or mutiny would be minuscule. In fact, maybe if you're a Helldiver that happens to make it back from a mission, you're refrozen and stuck at the back of the line, only to be woken up again decades later. At that point, you've had absolutely no concept of time, and your last memory would be of a successful mission defending liberty. For all you know, you're a fantastic soldier that's never lost and never will. Once you enlist, Super Earth will never let you retire or go home. As a Helldiver, all you'll ever be is a sacrifice in waiting for the betterment of Super Earth, liberty, and freedom. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Starting things off with one of the most requested and suggested theories, that of population control. The world of Helldivers 2 is set in the year 2184, about 100 years after the end of the first Galactic War, which I know I'm already pausing here, but that's why you watch, isn't it? 100 years is an awfully convenient time span to go from one war to another. It's almost as if the government is controlled by a group that cares more about aesthetics than the actual battle, right? I mean, we're already a group of kindergartners running around with not enough supervision and too many enormous firecrackers. As long as it came with more air support, Super Earth could probably tell us just about anything, and rest assured, there'd be a line of Helldivers around the super block. Speaking of that enormous line, where did all these soldiers come from? At the time of writing, hdgalaxy.com pegs the current death count at 1,397,451,310 Helldivers a number that I feel I need to give you a sense of scale for. I mean, we know that 1.4 billion is a big number, but let's add some context. Let's start with World War II. That's about 80 million people. Okay, not even close. Let's add in World War I with about 40 million deaths. Um, okay, how about we add in every modern conflict that's listed on Wikipedia which is another 164 conflicts in modern history. And with all of those wars, we're left with 1.4 billion versus about 430 million. Okay, add in the Black Death, another 50 million. How about the entire population of the US, another 330 million? And then I can guess we can add in the population of Europe as well. Only then do we get there. Needless to say, 1.4 billion deaths is a lot. So what's going on here? If we compare a global conflict like World War II, 80 million deaths, that was about 4% of the global population in 1940. 1.4 billion deaths would imply a global population of 35 billion. And even that seems like it's on the low end, considering all of those Helldivers have perished in the last three months. On the high end, I might assume a population closer to 100 billion. Now, I'm no planetary expert, but that seems like a lot of people. Which begs the question, what if the true purpose of the war has less to do with fighting and more to do with population control? Many people commented with this theory, but your best friend nobody was the first one that I saw. The war goes on and on, even though Super Earth most likely has a massive pool of resources to make a more controlled, determined farm. Plus, the automatons said that if we just let them be on Cyberstan, they'll stop invading Super Earth colonies. But Super Earth keeps going. Why? In my opinion, it's because they have an overpopulation. A good hint is in the ship we can hear a broadcast saying, citizens who wish to have children need to file a C-17 form. I'm guessing this form is to see if the family should have a kid due to overpopulation. The war is the perfect excuse to send billions to their deaths, 
to try to balance the population. This theory goes hand in hand with many other theories discussed in previous videos, much of which stem from a central idea that Super Earth is in one way or another fabricating this war. That the threat from the bugs is overblown or maybe fake to begin with, and the automatons really would just leave us alone if we gave them Cyberstan. I have some serious doubts about the last one, but maybe. If we're to assume all of that is true and we don't need to be fighting this war in the first place, we're left to face another harsh reality. Super Earth has such a high population that it cannot support all of its citizens. Now, some scientists claim that Earth as we know it today, in 2024, could actually sustain much higher populations, into the hundreds of billions, but I'm not sure the Super Earth of tomorrow is in the same situation. Recall that the map of Super Earth shows large swaths of territory that are uninhabitable. Those are the areas you can't even walk around in, let alone grow crops, raise livestock, or open a Super McDonald's. I have to assume that if those areas are that bad, there are also areas on the planet that won't kill you with radiation, but are still essentially smoldering piles of rubble. All of this to say, sure, Super Earth might be able to support 100 billion people in the year 2184, but I'm not so sure that it can. If you're the Super Earth Federation in this situation, you have very little you can do to reduce the population. You have a slow solution, basically limit everyone's ability to have children, then you have a fast solution. Turns out Super Earth said, why not both? Not only do you have to fill out a form to request to have a child, but they've also sent 1.4 billion Helldivers off to their deaths. And also, even if you are a Helldiver and you fill out a C-17 form, how are you ever going to have a baby? You're going to be a terminated snack in the next two minutes. And quite honestly, the biggest problem though that I have with this idea comes down to the fact that humanity is a spacefaring species. It's able to fly from planet to planet with faster than light technology. We also know that there are already outposts on other planets. So either all these outposts are self-sufficient and maybe closer to a city and a civilization than the word outpost might imply, or maybe they're all being supported by super earth getting regular deliveries of supplies to keep them alive. If this is the case, the overpopulation theory actually makes even more sense. Super Earth might have a population of 100 billion, but then you might have to add on billions of souls on other planets around the galaxy. Coupled with the cost of shipping supplies to them, if you thought the global supply chain disruptions were bad in 2021, just wait until you see the galactic supply chain disruptions of 2184. Instead of blocking the Suez Canal, we'll have automatons blocking the entire Talus sector. Budgets are tight this time of year. One thing you have to do when you're evaluating these theories is strike a healthy balance between things that are done for the sake of gameplay and things that are done for the sake of the story. It's absolutely critical that you evaluate each and every theory under this set of circums- Okay, who am I kidding? We're all just here to hear the most outlandish ideas possible, right? I do think there is a component of this that has to do with making compelling gameplay. But in my opinion, Arrowhead has actually done a lot of things right by integrating lore into the mundane, non-fighting type of gameplay that Helldivers engage in on a daily basis. At the end of the day, we're of course all here to play a fun action shooter, but I think a key component in the sticking power of Helldivers is how involved everyone gets in the world building. It's essentially a level of role playing, where almost, I don't know, probably a thousand comments in the last video contain the word treason in them. That doesn't even include variations of the phrase, if you expand that search to include reported or democracy officer or bug simp. It's probably closer to 90% of the comments. So when you extend this to other bits of the gameplay, what happens? One theory that we covered in the first video had to do with the idea that Super Earth is not really a government, but rather a giant super conglomerate or corporation. 
Many ideas in that first entry revolved around the idea that the purpose behind this war is really just about oil, or element 710, and resource gathering. But Razeroth takes things one step further to include a couple other key details that lend some credibility to the idea that Super Earth is really just in it for the bottom line. A corporation just like any other corporation on normal Earth in 2024, focused on ever-increasing profitability and cost savings. I think some more evidence of the conglomerate theory is the fact that one of the people on your ship has to pay for her own equipment. They also talk about budgetary reasons why hell pods can't come pre-armed. Hell divers have to pay for their own ship, which largely just allows for better automation. So back to my original point, is calling in ordinances a fun gameplay mechanic and pretty much one of the key differentiators between hell divers and any other space alien shooter? Sure, but is it a completely disjointed element of the game? Not at all. Not only does the ordinance mechanic add a really fresh, dynamic component to the gameplay, it's backed up by the internal lore of the game. In many ways, the ordinance component of the game reminds me a lot of the reloading system in Gears of War. If you've never played that game, I'm, I'm not sure how well it held up over the past few years, but the first couple were awesome. Essentially, they had an active reloading system where clicking the reload button began a tiny little quick time event where you had a small window to reload more quickly and give your bullets a little bit more power. Think of it like Wii Golf, but for annihilating the enemy horde. Anyways, that mechanic might seem at first blush to distract you from the gameplay, to take you out of the moment in order to focus on a weird little mini game, but I would argue it's actually improved your overall gameplay experience. When you weren't surrounded by enemies, it didn't really make much of a difference. But as soon as they were piling up around you, it added a huge element of tension. As if if you missed the active reload, your gun would jam momentarily, eating up precious moments before the enemy was on top of you. Much in the same way, the ordnance mechanic offers a grounded way to increase tension and add a dynamic gameplay mechanic to Helldivers that's grounded in a logical part of the lore. But this section isn't really about the mechanic, is it? We're supposed to be talking about budgets. So, the lore. Is Super Earth really a giant company and not a large government? Maybe? Is there really a difference at that point? Debatable? I will say the idea of Helldivers having to pay for their own equipment and upgrades to the ship, other cosmetic things, I guess I don't know who we would consider as the one paying for DLC. I guess it's you as the Helldiver. But there's a whole nother theory if it's you actually playing as the Super Destroyer and not the human. Anyways, the idea of the Helldiver paying for all of this does seem to point to a scenario where Super Earth is actually a large corporation rather than a government. It also raises the question of how much Helldivers get paid, and is there really any way that that amount of pay would equal the cost of a 500 kilogram bomb? I mean, modern Sidewinder missiles in the real world have a probably huge payload and an estimated cost in the, I don't know, hundreds of million, I don't know how much a Hellwinder, Sidewinder missile costs. Are those Helldivers taking a mortgage out on explosive ordnance? I suppose, if their life expectancy is two minutes, there isn't really much point in expecting them to pay it back. But that would just mean the cost would fall back on Super Earth, wouldn't it? Unless it's actually more nefarious than that, and Helldivers are actually accruing debt in their family's name. It'll saddle them with poverty until the heat death of the universe, or whenever the war ends, whichever comes first. After all, that would probably be the truly corporate way to go about business. Drill, baby, drill. Speaking of oil, let's talk a little bit more about Element 710, and more specifically, about the galactic conflict that surrounds it. Now, there is another theory out there that the Illuminate are actually so much more advanced than us that they don't actually use Element 710 at all, but I'm not gonna get into that in this video. They might power all their technology with some sort of fusion power, or other sufficiently advanced energy source, something that the engineers of Super Earth just can't crack the code on yet. And so the idea of them relying on Element 710 harvested from dead terminids is not very plausible, but 
let's pause for a moment and flip the script. Instead, what if we assume that the Illumin are not quite the extremely advanced species that they're made out to be, and do in fact rely on many of the same energy sources that Super Earth does, at least for faster than light travel, that is. They probably have something super advanced on their home planet, a Dyson sphere or something, but for their faster than light engines, they're still relying on that good old bug juice. If we're to lower our expectations of the level of sophistication the Illuminate possess, that actually changes quite a bit of the story. Suddenly, much of the justification behind our galactic war in the first place doesn't really hold water, or rather it's full of oil. Space oil? I'll let Dan Shiva 1498 expand on the idea. I love the idea that the reason Super Earth deemed the Illuminates a threat to wage war against wasn't because they discovered a planet-destroying weapon, but simply because Super Earth didn't want to share Element 710 with the Illuminates, who they discovered were also using it to fuel their planets. It makes sense when you think of the Illuminates it had a planet-destroying device, they would have used it at least once during the first war, or even during this one. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of relating the storylines of a piece of media to the context in which they were written. At the end of the day, the writers live in the current world and are influenced in some way or the other by the events that occur around them every day. And if there's one thing that's been an ever-present reality in the modern world, or who am I kidding, all of human history, it's conflicts over resources, more specifically to our current era that tends to involve conflict over oil, which I believe is quite evident in the world of Helldivers. So instead of a war that might have been hard to sell to prospective Helldivers, one that was focused on collecting as much Element 710 as possible, Super Earth changed the narrative. Instead of the Illuminate being a largely peaceful species that we wanted to steal resources from, they became a warring civilization, one with the power to destroy our entire planet. And yet, despite all this power, never once used it on Super Earth, or a Super Earth liberated planet. I guess I should stop there and point out that this isn't entirely true, but kind of mixes timelines together. It was possible to lose the war in Helldivers 1, in which case players were treated to this ending cinematic where Super Earth was obliterated by the enemy arsenal. I have to assume that it was either them, the Illuminate, or the Cyborgs, but most likely the Illuminate. I, I don't think the Cyborgs had planet-destroying weapons, and the Terminids definitely didn't. But in the timeline of Helldivers 2, that never happened. At least, supposedly not. And the Illuminate were eradicated without any planets being destroyed. I guess I'm not totally sure about the likelihood of that scenario, if there were another civilization on the brink of total annihilation and they possessed the capability to launch a counteroffensive, one that would destroy the enemy's planet, I feel like they might maybe use it. Maybe that's just the American brain bias in me, but overall, I'd give this theory a pretty plausible rating. I mean, I think there's some additional thinking that would need to be done around the weapons of planetary destruction. The Illuminate were supposedly a peaceful civilization, so they probably didn't want to launch bombs at civilians, even if they had that capability. One idea that might counter this would be that if we're to believe that Super Earth actually defeated the Illuminate, they probably would have targeted their planetary weapons during that war campaign, with the expressed purpose of removing them as a threat. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Where do you all stand on that Illuminate debate? Are they as advanced as Super Earth says they are? Or was that some propaganda meant to inspire higher enlistment numbers down at the local recruitment office? Let us know in the comments. Even if you think about this purely from Super Earth's perspective, they would probably rather be using a fuel source like Fusion if they had it. While they might not care about the lives of individual Helldivers, they do care about the monetary investment involved in training them, shipping them around the galaxy, outfitting them with some very expensive armor, and constantly launching an orbital strike at the command of each and every untrained Helldiver running around planet-side surrounded by chaos. 
how much easier would all this be if the whole system was just powered by fusion? No need to seed terminids around the galaxy. No need to waste resource <clears throat> human lives on harvesting those terminids. It would be so much more cost effective that Super Earth would probably make the switch if they were able to. But for the time being, I guess we'll just have to keep the pipelines flowing. Now, before we move on to the next one, consider subscribing to the channel. I'm assuming you're liking the content if you've made it this far into the video. And if you're watching, that also means there's a 98% chance that you're not subscribed. That's a really high number. Now, we're on our way to 10,000 subs, and I appreciate having all of you along for the ride. So that's enough from me. Just click that subscribe button. Ancient Ruins. I love that many of these theories are woven together in different ways, that each takes a small piece from another as if in totality they hint at something that might be true. We're all snooping around the edges of what might be an even greater truth. Even though at the end of the day, none of this might be real, it's the portion of these worlds that inspired me to start this channel and make these videos. So this theory goes along with some of the theories from the first video. If you haven't watched it yet, I'd suggest adding it to your up next or whatever. Lots of really cool ideas in there, submitted by other Helldivers. User The Last Customer pulled this idea from the original Iceberg video. Also worth watching if I do say so myself. There's probably other links some, somewhere up there. And so they expanded on several ideas in there, namely the possibility that the Illuminate were also farming the Terminids for fuel. To boil down that idea, we know that Super Earth got its faster than light travel technology from the Illuminate. So it's safe to assume, unless you're like the previous theory, that the Illuminate also rely on Element 710 for fuel and for fueling their space travel. Super Earth obviously has terminid farms set up across the galaxy. It's often pointed to as one of the ways that the terminids originally spread. We farmed them on planets all over the galaxy, and after a period of time with increased mutation, whether intentional or not, the Terminids broke free of their freedom farms and began fighting back. But as the last customer points out in their comment, hang on a sec. The idea of Illuminant harvesting Terminids. Tooltip says you might stumble across ancient ruins scattered in the galaxy. Disregard them or it'll be considered treason. What if those ruins are from Illuminant farming and a stray tooltip that points towards a larger secret. Generally speaking, when Super Earth tells you to look the other way, there's a good chance that something is being covered up. Now, what exactly are these ruins? What are they telling you to ignore? It's hard to say exactly. As pointed out above, if you were to stay on topic for a second, which I know is difficult for me to do, those ruins might be the remains of Illuminate's terminated farms. In the same way that Super Earth has set up farms all over the galaxy, whether out of convenience or to be closer to some source of terminids, it's unknown. But the Illumina likely had similar motives. We know that they're an extragalactic species. We're told that they came from outside the known galaxy, so it's safe to assume that the galaxy might be large for us. The scale of Illuminate travel and dominance might be much larger than Super Earth is able to comprehend. The Illuminate might have set up depots across our known galaxy eons ago as a means to store or harvest fuel on their travels. One thing that we don't have any conception of is how efficient faster-than-light travel is. How many terminated corpses does it take to fill up a barrel of crude Element 710? Is there a way to get a rough estimate on fuel efficiency? How many light years of travel per bug? LYPB? Or maybe you'd better measure it by bugs per light year, BPLY. Neither is quite as catchy as MPG, but anyway. When Helldivers go down and harvest Terminids, are we harvesting just enough oil to take our ship from point A to point B? Or are we creating a surplus that can supply Super Earth? Before we move on, the other things to explore briefly is the other possibility of these ruins. What else could they be? What other purposes might they have served? Were they even from the Illuminate? There isn't really any indication of the function of the ruins, either from the tooltip or from what you find planet side, but it does say ruins. And what pops into your head when you refer to something like ruins? Mayan ruins? 
cities, civilizations. Now, put aside for the moment who these ruins belong to, it was probably the Illuminate, but it doesn't really matter. I doubt they belong to the Terminids, but the other possibility could be the cyborgs. I don't know if they were able to spread very far or if they were kept on Cyberstan completely. But regardless, the presence of entire cities on other planets within our galaxy would reinforce the idea that we're not truly alone in this galaxy. To me, it's almost more exciting to assume that they aren't the remains of an Illuminate civilization, and actually that they're of some other civilization. And the more I think about it, I think we're told that the Illuminate were originally a species that developed in water. So I don't know that it would really make any sense for them to have cities on land. This would all go to say that when I spoke about other factions in the last video, this might be further proof that someone or something is lurking out in the shadows of the galaxy, watching and observing, waiting for their opportunity to strike. It could also be that the ruins are just old super earth farms and they just don't want you to think about it too much. That's also a possibility, but. Forced evolution. In a rare double up from the same source, let's look at another one the last customer sent in. Again, based on the original iceberg video that I did. In it, we talked about the possibility of the Terminid Towers and that they might be causing mutations amongst the Terminids, all of which turned out to be 100% true. Honestly, my batting record is pretty good with Helldivers predictions right now, so I'm probably going to jinx it, but I'm feeling pretty good. Anyways, this theory takes all of this and flips it on its head. Sure, the Termicide might mutate the Terminids, but what if it's all on purpose? What if Termicide is meant to mutate them? What if it's a massive forced experiment? Of course, some of them will die, they say, similar to the effects of radiation, but it might cause a more accelerated evolution. Honestly, this is giving me pretty major Fallout vibes, which means that I really need to get working on that iceberg for Fallout. The part of me doubts that this one was really on purpose. The way that the Terminids reacted and took over the spray towers seemed a little unintentional, especially the manner in which Super Earth issued the commands to shut them all down. It, it all seemed pretty reactive. It, but let's assume for a moment that it was all intentional. After all, we don't really know how the bugs get from planet to planet. And if it's true that Super Earth is the one somehow shepherding them around the galaxy, the entire threat of the Terminids is a farce. If they're unable to spread from planet to planet on their own, we could just leave them alone and Super Earth would be in no added danger. But of course, we need to continue mining oil, sorry, Element 710, in order to fuel the ever expansion of the Super Earth Empire. What then could be the point of the forced mutation? The obvious answer is that they are looking for ways to improve the efficiency of gathering element 710. And maybe there are some mutations that cause each terminid to produce more element 710 upon death. And maybe larger terminids produce an outsized amount of oil compared to their smaller brethren. That is to say, if a bile titan is roughly the size of four chargers, let's pretend, maybe its weight to element 710 ratio is higher. Maybe instead of four chargers worth of oil, a bio titan produces five chargers worth of oil. A, a, buy, a buy four gallons, get the fifth one free sort of situation. Extrapolate, and maybe in the eventual future when we're hunting down hive lords, they could contain truly the mother load of element 710. Perhaps the reason behind the force mutation is all in an effort to breed larger and larger terminates, those that can produce larger and larger quantities of oil. Element 710. Honestly, it's really almost identical to how we raise chickens nowadays. So it's not really all that far-fetched of an idea. But you know me, I can't just stop there. I need to push it to the edges of what's possible. Something so outlandish that no one has heard it before. So stick with me. But what if the force mutation is not so much being done with the purpose of creating fatter terminids, that's certainly a byproduct, but what if Super Earth is diversifying its arsenal? I talked in the past about the possibility that Super Earth is actually using terminids as weapons, sending them into areas to soften up or 
altogether wipe out any resistance before sending in the Helldivers for cleanup duty. What if the real purpose behind the mutation experiments is to provide Super Earth with an increased range of terminated weapons that it can rain down on enemies? You know, we obviously developed 500 kilogram bombs at one point, but they started smaller, 20 kilograms, and we built up. What if the same can be said for terminates? Maybe they've seen how effective the technique has been with rebel humans and their illegal broadcasting stations, which this channel is definitely not. <clears throat> and they're looking ahead to a looming threat of the automatons and cyborgs, and they may be thinking, this is working really well over here, why don't we beef it up and send a little surprise to the automatons in the future? I don't know. I'm sure that Super Earth and a Terminate Alliance is not on anyone's bingo card, but I can dream, can't I? What would you do if you found out that your brain, your consciousness, was not original to your body? That it had been extracted and then re-uploaded to a new host, and that that had happened tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of times? What would you do? That's one theory of many Helldiver 2 theories that we're going to be discussing, along with a healthy assortment of other, shall we say, creative ideas that push the boundaries of this lowly action shooter. Is it too much hype for the game to live up to? Almost assuredly. But is there a reason for us not to talk about game theories? Probably, but we're going to do it anyway. I know a lot of you listen to this while you're actively defending Super Earth from terminated invasions, but next time you sacrifice yourself for the sake of Super Earth, like the video, subscribe, say hi in the comments, or leave some of your own theories below. Maybe I'll put them in a future video. All right, let's get into things. Super-ish soldiers. Some of you have an issue with the way that I've described Helldivers' combat abilities. I have been known to refer to them as, quote, not especially talented, cannon fodder, and unsupervised kindergartners. But can you really blame me? Apparently, some of you can, and in doing so, present a pretty thoughtful idea around the Super Earth Training Regiment, and a convincing claim around the somewhat Darwinian method by which a Helldiver's skills are honed. As a quick refresher, this theory will also touch on the overpopulation theory that has gained some traction in recent days, the idea that Super Earth is actually facing a massive overpopulation problem, and that the fastest way to curb said problem is to send all of your able-bodied citizens off to war. From user Rack as an Iron, 19, uh, 1696, excuse me. Helldivers are not especially talented to begin with. True, but that lacks some interesting context. Their training sucks. I mean, it's infallible. Don't report me to the democracy officer. Why does it suck? Because why waste expense when the human resource can be replenished and it solves an overpopulation problem? Super Earth's perspective. But it's, from an overall effectiveness point of view, a brilliant and evil way of managing the human resources of war. Here's why. What actually breeds the best soldiers is experience rather than training. All training, while beneficial and preferable to the individual, is inherently fallible compared to the real thing. Because it's not the real thing. Experienced soldiers will virtually almost always beat a merely trained soldier in any fight, and the more experienced, the better. The average combat readiness of a Helldiver recruit is 24%. The odds are likely they'll be killed on their first drop, or not long after, but the nine difficulty levels the game offers actually demonstrate why this is an effective way to build an army, probably unintentionally. The ones who continuously survive drops, initially by luck and intuition alone, become a cheaply trained force capable of fighting like a well-trained one. This weirdly goes a long way to explain why they keep the combat teams so small and run reinforcements on a budget, and stratagems on a cooldown. Super Earth is min-maxing the efficiency of their fighting force by neglecting training and sacrificing large amounts of soldiers early on but still receiving the benefits of having an experienced army anyways. 
Min-maxing the efficiency of a galactic army is such a funny concept. I mean, it's made all the more ironic by the fact that, honestly, with the scale that we're talking about, it's probably the most effective way for a government like Super Earth to ever train an army. My previous video talked more about the overpopulation issue, pointing out that over 1.4 billion Helldivers have died at this point in the war. If you kept statistics similar to World War II, where approximately 1 in 40 soldiers died, that would imply a military of at least 56 billion Helldivers, which is honestly just a staggering number. The Vietnam War was said to have a death ratio of about 1 in 58, which would imply over 80 million, uh, excuse me, 80 billion health divers waiting frozen on board ships around the galaxy. All to say Super Earth having any hope of training 50 to 80 billion soldiers with any effectiveness is just wishful thinking to say the least. Thank Gaming 7753 also chimed in on the level of eliteness, we'll say, that the Helldivers have. I don't really buy the Helldivers not being elite. I mean, I get it, the training is short, sure, but if that Helldiver training is taken at face value, then we also need to take the players at face value, and their actions as being canon too. I'd say the majority of players last longer than two minutes. I'd say they're definitely more elite than we think, but not at the level of ODSTs or something of the like. They have to be. More objectives are completed than failed. Presumably, we're more often than not taking more ground than we're losing. Well, yeah, I'm not going to pretend they're super soldiers. We have to acknowledge that they aren't strictly the two-minute cannon fodder they're advertised as. Some divers die right out of the pod. Some live for 10-plus missions, and that's due to skill. Thank Gaming makes a few good points here. It's difficult to argue that the pure number of recorded deaths of Helldivers is high, but on the other hand, if you were playing as Helldivers and, and you died every two minutes, I don't think many people would be sticking around to play the game. That's like Call of Duty veteran difficulty levels. It's not fun. No, that doesn't seem to be quite 100% true. But it's hard to square those two facts, which makes me move on to one more connected theory that might help explain things. Mind Control That's right, we've finally done it. Jumped off the deep end into sci-fi territory that probably doesn't have a whole lot to back it up, except for fan determination and imagination. So let's take a look at some of the theory crafting here. I'm not totally certain where this idea began, but I've seen it mentioned quite a few times in one way or another, so I'm going to take snippets from two commenters and use them, and if I didn't include yours, better luck next time, I guess. There really is no shortage of these ideas, so I'm sure we're going to be able to string together a part four at some point. Just leave your comments below. So, in general, many of these ideas revolve around the central idea that somehow Helldivers are not exactly what they claim to be, or what Super Earth claims they are. They're either clones or robots or controlled by someone else remotely. All of these ideas orbiting around one central premise that despite all appearances, the Helldivers are a charade. First, from KR Translator 6701, who is drilling in on what it means to be a Helldiver. I've been thinking about something similar for a while. We, the players, are just minds of the original Helldivers from long ago, and whenever the physical body is killed, our minds are transferred to the next available body. I say this because when we join another ship and come on board, we're taken out of one of the cryopods rather than spacewalking or taking a transport vessel to aboard another Helldiver Super Earth Destroyer. And when you return to your ship alone, you have to go back to the cryopods, essentially returning the body you borrowed from that Super Earth Destroyer and your mind is just sent back to your Super Destroyer to be uploaded into one of the bodies on your ship. That's why the basic training is so simple and quick, because it's just all for show for the body donors to feel like they're going through an official training. But essentially, you're just a sleeve that will be used for an already existing Helldiver mind. Almost like the Altered Carbon Show series, 
That's why even when a Helldiver dies on the field and a new Helldiver is sent to the planet, the mind, you, the player, still knows what's going on. Like, the skills you possess, where you dropped, your weapons, and so on. And then this brings us to the question, it's quite amazing and weird that the Super Destroyer actually contains bodies with all possible combination of armor, helmet, and cape frozen. So, that last bit, I think, is it's part of the game. But, this is a theory video, right? So, the biggest gripe that I have with this cloning theory overall has to do with one tweet from Arrowhead Studios' former CEO and current chief creative officer, Johan Pilsd... Pilsted? Pils Pilsted? In which he essentially says that, no, Helldivers are not clones, but he does it in a way that makes it feel like it isn't a joke or tongue-in-cheek like pretty much every other announcement that comes out about Helldivers. So... I'm kind of inclined to believe him. But what he doesn't say is that there isn't some sort of clever workaround to make this theory still work. KR Translator presents this concept in a form of uploaded consciousness, a la Altered Carbon. I watched about two episodes of that a few years ago and I just couldn't get into it. Maybe it was just me. Let me, let me just, oh, no, it wasn't. It's not just me. But, like Altered Carbon, maybe you have some original fighting force of Helldivers, say from the First Galactic War a hundred years ago, and it's their consciousnesses that are being repeatedly deployed, extracted, and deployed over and over again. Except, the ultimate twist here is that it isn't so much the Helldivers' consciousness that's being extracted, but yours as the player. This doesn't entirely go against what Arrowhead says, the body of the Helldiver might be a clone, kept alive in a freezer like a Burger King Whopper until the moment is right, but the mind, or the soul if you will, is a real being with a family back home. Or at least had a family back home at one point, a hundred years ago. User Duspende takes things one step further to provide an explanation as to why this process would be beneficial in the first place. I have a theory regarding the Helldivers themselves. Some people seem to think they're clones, but I don't buy that. I would like to propose the idea that the helmets the Helldivers wear actually record their stream of consciousness. Think about it. When you join a friend's Super Destroyer, what are the odds they just so happen to have theoretically infinite clones of every single Helldiver currently active? Pretty slim. I posit that they just upload your consciousness to a random Helldiver in cryostasis on the host ship. When a Helldiver dies, their consciousness and memories are uploaded to another random Helldiver. Since the Helldivers in cryostasis are all fresh out of basic, it's ostensibly a form of accelerated evolution in terms of combat prowess. As you come down in the next Hellpod after being reinforced, you thaw on your way down in the Hellpod and the new Helldiver has learned from previous mistakes in combat. This also explains why you get to keep your rank, and why a fresh out of basic Helldiver would be given their own entire Super Destroyer. Because the original Helldiver is an investment in future Helldivers that come after. So, in a nutshell, we're all basically Tom Cruise in that action movie, Edge of Tomorrow, or Live, Die, Repeat, whatever it was called, learning from a death that just happened, only to dive down seconds later and likely blow ourselves up again. This narrative also counters the widely perpetuated myth that Helldivers are unskilled, they lack the training to successfully fight off the enemy, that they're an uncoordinated group of clowns in bulletproof armor. They're none of those things. Instead, they're actually a smaller group of immortal super soldiers living out the worst version of Groundhog Day over and over and over again. I think this is a really cool theory, but I'm stuck on the fact that Helldivers would remember dying each time, and would therefore know that they aren't the original. Unless, of course, Super Earth had a way to trim the last five seconds of their memories before uploading it to the cloud. That might save them a little bit of their sanity and some of their dignity at the same time. Not every Helldiver death is quite as valiant as the last, so maybe it's for their own good. MetaQuest 3 While we're on the topic of messing with the brains of Helldivers, let's add one more to the list. At first, I was thinking this was a bridge too far, but then I realized we're already 
pretty far out on this bridge and it already looks like the Tacoma incident. So what's the harm in going a few steps further? Put on your Helldiver helmet with me and ask yourself, why am I wearing this? What purpose could this helmet actually be serving? Okay, hold your horses. Don't answer just yet. I know there are some very obvious answers to this question. Number one and two on that list being, one, helmets are good protection to wear in an active combat zone, and two, all of these battles are happening on other planets. They probably help the Helldivers breathe in an unfamiliar atmosphere. Okay, now that we've gotten the boring answers out of the way, how about we have some fun with it? What if the helmets have a dual purpose? Maybe they do all the basics, like keep you alive and yada, yada, yada. But what if they also serve another purpose and are in fact the radicalizing element of the Helldivers? Something that convinces the Helldivers to act on their most democratic instincts. I'll let Restotech take it from here. I kind of have my own theory. We all know the leaders of Super Earth are all corrupt, and the Helldivers are always wearing helmets, probably because they're in space. But what if the Terminids and Automatons are actually other humans? Humans fighting for their freedom and survival. The helmets all have vision-altering properties that make these humans appear as bugs and robots. This is only revealed when Super Earth is destroyed or taken down. Quite a fun theory on my part. Smiley emoji. And that would be some plot twist. Now, out of the gate, this reminds me a little bit of an episode of that show on Netflix, Alice in Borderland. I only watched one season, but there was an early episode where the main characters put on some sort of collar or helmet device that turns them into either hunter or prey, and it forces them to fight their friends to the death. I'm probably misremembering parts of that, but this definitely isn't the first piece of media to use that kind of plot device. Let me know in the comments if this is reminding you of something else that I'm blanking on. But we all put on these helmets and suddenly they transform the world around us, changing enemies, whether rebel factions or just completely unrelated sovereign societies, into gargantuan bugs and Terminator robots. Supported by heaps and heaps of propaganda, the Helldivers are more than willing to fire upon an enemy that they've been trained to hate. Before I get to my main issues with the theory, this would tie up a few loose ends. For instance, we don't really have to wonder anymore about how Terminids get from planet to planet if they aren't really Terminids at all. They're just people. They just get on their own spaceships and they fly to another planet. The fact that there are always a resurgence of enemies, even after we've liberated a planet over and over and over, that's just more people joining a rebel cause. And after Helldivers shoot down from space and annihilate their friends and family, it's just more people joining the cause. That's why they're always resurging. There will never be a shortage of enemies if the helmets can turn any threat into a bug or a bot. Lastly, there are all those ports on the back of the helmet. Again, obvious explanations here involve a port for oxygen or a way to freeze the Helldivers once they get back on board the ship. But it also seems like a great way to inject some sort of psychoactive drug that would induce a frenzy on billions of Helldivers when faced with virtual reality nightmares charging towards them. Now, all that said, there is a few issues with a theory worth discussing. Surprisingly, one part I didn't have an issue with is the scale of enemies. Large enemies like Bile Titans could be enemy machines that are turned into giant bugs through the magic of VR. Flying enemies like Shriekers could be enemy drones. Small enemies like Scavengers could be attack dogs. Chargers might just be enemy tanks. And honestly, I feel like the automaton enemies are all pretty self-explanatory. That's probably the easier thing for VR to do. Or AR? It's probably AR, I guess, right? No. The biggest issue I have has more to do with the actual attack patterns. As in, if the Terminids were actually human beings masked by VR and AI, the way they charge at you doesn't really make any sense, unless we're fighting uncontacted tribes that are still fighting with spears and bow and arrows, or swords. But then again, I doubt a spear would do much to the armor that Helldivers wear. And honestly, the more I think about it, the, the more devious this idea is. There might not actually be any threat at all, and Helldivers are just wandering the galaxy, colonizing... 
democratizing random civilizations that haven't unlocked this space travel skill tree yet. Okay, we are way too far in the weeds, so let's back things up and move on to a less politically charged topic. The Super Earth Educational System Speaking of fuel, the Illuminate, stolen technology, and Element 710, and the place where all of those intersect, user Finn9365 brings us an interesting twist on what many of us assume was already canon. We all know that Super Earth stole or otherwise acquired their faster than light travel from the Illuminate, but what we don't know was the exact manner in which we acquired it. Was it freely given? Doubtful. More than likely, Super Earth recovered the tech from a downed Illuminate spaceship and was then able to reverse engineer it into something usable by humanity. So, in that reverse engineering process, they would have had to discover or uncover the fuel source. How on Super Earth did the Illuminate power their faster than light travel? One likely answer based on their weapons technology was some sort of fusion, something that humans likely have not mastered. I'll let Finn present their case. I'd like to think that the reason Super Earth needs oil as a fuel source for their faster than light drives is because we did a piss poor job at adapting the tech we stole from the Illuminates. Our drives probably aren't nearly as efficient as the Illuminates were, since we need such a relatively crude fuel source as compared to what the drives were probably designed to use, which was probably a form of fusion. I've been theorizing for a while now that the Illuminate are using similar technology to humans on Super Earth and have a similar relationship to the Terminids, using their corpses for fuel in their travels around the galaxy. But on closer inspection, I wonder if Finn is onto something here. The Illuminate, by most accounts, are a peaceful civilization, not one so hungry for war like Super Earth. They really didn't even want to be in conflict with us in the first place, supposedly. Because of that, I also wonder if they didn't want to be in conflict with the Terminids either. I doubt that a species that was described as such would be interested in the systematic culling of an enormous population of semi-sentient bugs. More likely, they might have found a way to coexist. Something that's pretty hard to do if you're harvesting huge swaths of their species for fuel all the time. No, instead, the Illuminates found an alternate power source that was essentially limitless, which makes sense with our perception of how advanced they are. It's somewhat doubtful we would have perceived them as so sufficiently advanced if they were using all the same technology as Super Earth. If they were driving around in a Model T, we wouldn't think of them as a super advanced civilization. Instead, when we defeated them, however that actually happened, we stole their tech and adapted it in a manner that fit our abilities. No fusion, no problem. Just roll down to your local gas station and fill it up with a tank of fresh terminated blood. Element 710. They grow up so fast. Alright, so last time I talked about a new enemy type being introduced, it was literally added between the time that I recorded the audio and when I uploaded the video. Speaking, of course, about the Factory Strider, the giant at at, AT, -AT the thing that pumps out new enemy automatons while on the move. So, in keeping with that topic, let's revisit another colossal class enemy that there are plenty of hints about, the Terminid Hive Lord. Now, in the Iceberg video, we touched on the topic of the Hive Lord, but we mainly talked about their purpose in battle, and how large they might actually be. Let's touch on those again, but now with the added context of the Factory Strider. The Hive Lord is a formidable foe, certainly, but it also plays a dynamic role on behalf of its terminated comrades. Termini? When the Hive Lord tunnels through the core of a planet, it's doing so in a way that opens up new supply channels for more terminids to emerge. In other words, from a meta perspective, it functions in almost an identical manner to the Factory Strider. It peruses the battlefield with some offensive capability, but it also actively reinforces the enemies with more grunts on the battlefield. The more I think about it from this perspective, and the perspective of Arrowhead wanting to create a balanced and symmetric gameplay system, I'm almost 100% certain that the Hive Lords will be added in the near future. But let's talk a little more about the Hive Lord skeletons that we see scattered around different planets under Terminid control. 
Commenter Gloop de Gale suggests that they aren't really skeletons at all, at least not in the sense of the word, but rather exoskeletons, the husks of a creature that's still alive and simply outgrew their former shell, like cicadas moving from larva stage, or whatever stage you call it, if you're a cicadaologist, I don't, I don't want to hear it, to the adult stage. These hive lords are moving from a smaller, more pupil stage to their larger or colossal, colossal-er stage, one fitting of their name. Here's Gloop. Another spoiler warning for content related to data file leaks. On the topic of colossal enemies, the hive lord husks on the planet aren't husks, but left behind exoskeletons. So the reason the husks are so smallish is because they're getting bigger. Plus, there is an asset for a colossal illuminant strider for the up-and-coming enemy, so it wouldn't be too far off for them to include a colossal class for the Terminates. The obvious further implications that are brought up are the future implications for other factions. As Gloop mentions, there are assets that were leaked that show an illuminant strider, or at the very least, a large, large illuminate enemy. I don't know if it's entirely clear what size class that enemy would belong to, but for instance, is it really a colossal class enemy or is it just a large enemy, one that would be about the same size as the Bile Titan or the Automaton Factory Strider? It's not really clear. I might venture an optimistic guess that the Strider is not truly a colossal enemy, if only to hold out hope that even larger ones are still in the development pipeline. It's totally possible, considering we also don't seem to have any leaks that I know of related to the Hive Lords, which are all but guaranteed. Or the cyborgs for that matter, which who knows when they might get introduced. With all that in mind, I'm of the opinion that the devs would want each faction to have similar classes within them, and it makes perfect sense, whenever possible, to create a somewhat more predictable gameplay experience. So it follows that not only will the Terminid faction need to have an enemy that's capable of dropping off reinforcements, but all future factions will likely have similar capabilities, and an enemy introduced that serves that function. If anything, as I'm typing this out, I'm getting a very clear sense that Arrowhead has a long future planned out for Helldivers, with updates that all just kind of make sense. That at least makes me hopeful that the game won't get diluted down anytime soon. If any Arrowhead employees watch this video, maybe I'm giving you a few ideas. Either that or I'm going on some sort of block list. Super fake Earth. On to a theory that was probably one of the more controversial ones in the Iceberg video. The idea that Super Earth might not in fact be the same Earth that you and I love. The Super Earth of Helldivers 2 may in fact be something completely different altogether. And the Super Earth Federation is actively censoring this information for some reason getting you all, you sheep, to believe you're fighting on behalf of your home planet, when in fact that planet was destroyed a hundred years ago in the First Galactic War. I've touched on this one already, Helldivers 1 is essentially a loop of never-ending war campaigns, and there are scenarios where the Helldivers and Super Earth are overcome by waves of enemies, forced to abandon their home and regroup on another. We see all these ships warping out from around a Earth, after which we see that planet demolished, Death Star style. The captain of the ship also gives an inspiring soliloquy about regrouping and eventually exacting revenge on our enemies. We're led to believe that this scenario is completely separate from the timeline when we are playing in Helldivers 2, but I'd ask you to suspend your disbelief for just a moment and imagine that maybe we did lose the first war, and that Super Earth was destroyed. Dobra Dead 76 has some evidence that might just support that idea. Sometimes when you're spawned in in Helldivers 2, you're teleported to Super Earth's system. This has at least happened before the second automaton invasion, and if you look down from your super destroyer, the actual planet looks nothing like actual Earth. It's green and blue, sure, but there is not a single landmark or continent recognizable. And the planet that is Mars where Helldiver training goes on, could just be any desert planet, as the quote-unquote Mars and Helldivers 2 seems to have an atmosphere since Terminids can live and breathe there. So, a couple things. First of all, 
It is really hard to confirm anything about orbiting super Earth. It seems to be a relatively uncommon experience. And the only screenshot I'm able to find has them orbiting at night. So you can't really see anything. Others have said that your super destroyer sometimes loads in above super Earth. And yet I still have not really seen any proof of that. So I'll need some of you in the comments to provide some input here. According to Dobro Dead, when they have loaded in above Super Earth, it looked nothing like the Earth of our reality. So let's take that at face value for now and move on to other points about your training grounds. Most of you will remember your basic training, I'm sure. You're running around obstacle courses on a desert planet that Super Earth tells you is Mars. You dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge around low ceilings and the occasional turret that targets you. But then you reach a point where a terminated warrior pops out and you do some basic target practice. Now here's the contentious part. We know that in the current world, oxygen makes up about 0.1% of the atmosphere on Mars. The overwhelming remainder, about 95% of it, is CO2. I have to assume that the helmets and armor that hell divers wear must account for this allowing Helldivers to dive on planets that are not suitable for human habitation. There are just too many planets on the map. I doubt all of them have the right atmospheric conditions for humans to seamlessly land there and breathe naturally. But this isn't really about the humans. To me, it's more about the Terminates. They are living creatures. They must have some requirements to breathe properly. Even if they're bugs, they still need oxygen. I think I told the biologist to pipe down earlier in this video, but I need you back now. It's been a while since my last bio class, but I'm pretty sure oxygen is a fundamental component of life. It helps cells live or whatever, ATP cycle and all that jazz. Whatever, you need it. And so do the bugs. So if quote unquote Mars has terminids on it, there must be some type of oxygen rich atmosphere there. The terminids don't run around with helmets on and even though they may have adapted to a wide range of environments, they still need the basic building blocks to survive. To go one step further, this has me wondering about the automatons. Sure, they are mostly robots, but if the theories about their creation are true, and they really do have more human components than you might like to believe, don't they need oxygen as well? In particular, if they're using human brains, I'm almost certain they would need oxygen to keep those brains alive. Otherwise, the robots would just constantly be passing out from hypoxia. But I guess it's possible that they have an oxygen canister built into the body somewhere. That's possible. Overall, this is probably one of the most unlikely theories on the list, but I do find it super interesting just because of how shocking the twist would be if it ever came out. Maybe there's still hope for a giant super earth sized surprise, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. Unnatural selection. As I was reading through the comments on the first video, and believe me, I read through every single comment that gets posted. So if I left a heart next to it, that means I read it. And even if I didn't respond, I still read it. But as I was reading the comments, there really weren't all that many theories that revolved around the automatons. Plenty of comments about treason, and no one really, though, was asking the really hard-hitting questions, like, what do automatons do for fun? Are there automaton sports? I don't know. A surprising topic that I don't see too much discourse on is where the automatons actually came from. There are a lot of surface-level ideas revolving around the cyborgs creating them, or the use of human bodies or brains and the construction of them, but less about their actual origins, their advancement or their purpose. But here's a theory from Astro5277, who is questioning the nature of how the automatons came to be. I have a theory that the automatons are ascended cyborgs, and that they have some sort of manufacturing system to basically clone them, build more automatons and copy over their code slash brain, which is how there are so many of them. Thoughts? Plenty of thoughts. So. If I might summarize and express the theory a little bit differently, while most theories and lore tend to assume that the cyborgs created the automatons, Astro is asking instead, what if these cyborgs became the automatons? At least, that's what I'm gathering from the question. It turns instead into a question about evolution of sorts, rather than creation. This would also open the door for a world where the cyborgs don't actually exist anymore. Similar to Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, 
us big, smart, modern-day humans had better brains to think more good, and our ancestors just couldn't keep up. But what if the automatons are the same way? Somewhere along the way, cyborgs were forced, or decided to, that part's unclear, but either way, they became more and more augmented until they became what we know today as cyborgs. I do question the propaganda that Super Earth puts out. They say that the cyborgs, in one way or another, enjoy augmenting themselves, or that they do it out of some twisted religious idea, but when you look at pictures of them, they definitely don't look happy. It also brings up the question of whether the quote-unquote normal cyborgs look like that. Are we just seeing soldier class cyborgs, or are there everyday cyborgs that you would find working at a coffee shop as a barista? I feel like the lack of thumbs and circular saw for a hand would make latte art really, really challenging, you know? I would say that the immediate red flag that sticks out to me in almost all of these theories is the issue that we just can't get around, that of the time frame, the timeline. There just isn't all that much time between the events of the first galactic war and the events of the second, especially not on a galactic evolutionary timeline. There simply wouldn't be enough generations for the cyborgs to be wiped out. But even while I type that sentence out, I'm realizing there might be a grain of doubt in there. Imagine for a second that the cyborgs kept augmenting and augmenting, eventually reaching a point where there were more cyborgs in existence that were more machine than living being, perhaps even reaching a point where their brain was controlled by an artificial intelligence. How then might that artificial intelligence respond to its newfound autonomy? Is it plausible that it might seek to expand that autonomy? Certainly. If that's a pressing conversation with OpenAI in the year 2024, it would almost certainly be a topic in the 2080s and beyond. And how might that AI choose to expand its liberty? I don't think it's entirely far-fetched to come to the conclusion that that AI brain might take over all the connected cyborg slash automaton hybrids that were in a hive mind, essentially and then use them to entirely eliminate the remaining pure cyborgs. Essentially, this entire thought experiment is that paperclip theory wrapped up in a Helldiver or automaton robot body. But it also doesn't seem entirely impossible to me. Once all the cyborgs were wiped out, the remaining automatons would be free to pillage their remains and create more automatons, and eventually strike out across the galaxy looking for ways to expand and create an ever-growing automaton army. But, yeah, I'm sure there won't be any problems with OpenAI in the future. For sure. So, while we're all fighting closer and closer to Cyberstan, I'm not sure that we'll ever get there, but we're trying. And while we have no idea what we'll find when we arrive, it's possible that all of this has been misinterpreted and that the cyborgs are truly gone or have transcended or evolved into the automatons we know today. Maybe by the time we get there, democracy willing, we won't find any cyborgs at all, but instead just a race of automatons that see the cyborgs as their mythical creators, ancestors that sacrifice themselves in order for a future generation to have a chance at evening the score with Super Earth. But I think that does it for this video. That's seven theories that I thought were pretty interesting. But if you have comments on those theories or even more theories you want me to look into, put them in the comments and I'll try to put them in another video. I'm on video three right now of theories, so there's probably room for four or five. I don't know. We'll just keep going until you guys get sick of theories. But anyway, as always, there's lots of other content on the channel that you can check out if you like other fictional series and I'm gonna continue to add more videos. So like the video, subscribe, follow for more, share it with your friends, all the normal YouTube stuff. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.